Hello, I'm Shigeto Kawahara from Keio University. In this video, I want to explain why I'm studying sound symbolism as a generative phonologist. Let's begin this slide uh, by explaining what sound symbolism is. So a long-standing question in linguistics, philosophy, psychology, and cognitive science is this. Do sounds have meanings or are sound meaning correspondences completely arbitrarily? There are two positions with regard to this issue. So sure, and many of the following linguistic theories, including generative linguistics, say not really. On the other hand, other theories embrace sound symbolism, saying that there are uh, systematic connections between sound and meanings. And this actually goes back to Socrates. And it seems that many contemporary cognitive linguists um, uh, say, yes, there are some systematic correspondences between sounds and meanings. I myself um, is, was a generative phonologist by training at least. And I used to be a very hardcore optimality theory practitioner as a graduate student. And I'm, if you ask me, I still feel very attached to it. But generative linguists barely pay attention to sound symbolism. That's, that's kind of fact. Okay, here's a very telling quote. Um, here I'm not implying anything negative, but this represents a general attitude of generative linguists towards sound symbolism. This is a paper by John McCarthy about a old segmental features in onomatopoetic ex expressions in many languages. He says, uh, many of the examples that I discuss here may be subsumed under the general des designation of sound symbolism because they make phonetic distinctions that stand in an essential iconic relationship with their meaning. My concern is entirely with the formal properties of these systems. And I skip the next sentence and say, thus I have nothing to say about the issue of iconic versus symbolic meaning. So he's aware that it's the, the pattern is about sound symbolism, but he's interested in only the phonological aspect. Assuming that the phonological properties and these iconic meanings are separate matters. And I actually feel very differently right now. More concretely, I think that formal phonology and research on sound symbolism can and should inform one and form each other. Um, I was very inspired by this paper by Aldredi and Kojetov in language. And actually, um, I got a rejection from a theory, a very theory heavy journal. I submitted a paper on sound symbolism and the editor said, well, we a theoretical linguistics journal it has to be interesting for the, read, uh, for the general audience. And now that I think about it, I wasn't very clear why studying sound symbolism is interesting for theoretical phonologists. And that made me think more about it. And that resulted in this paper that was recently published in Language, Language and Linguistic Compass. Okay, and um, this, this slide is really based on that paper. And I, in that paper, I make this point that um, we share many common interests. And this is the focus of this lecture. So studies in sound symbolism and theoretical phonology share many interests, and I'm going to go over each of these uh, common interests. First, phonetic naturalness. One of the very actively debated questions in the contemporary phonological theory is this question. Are synchronic phonological systems phonetically natural? There's one camp of people who say yes, phonological patterns are driven by phonetic imperatives like promoting articulatory ease and perceptual distinctiveness. This is known as the phonetically driven phonology enterprise that was actively pursued in uh, UCLA when I was a graduate student. On the other hand, there's another camp of people who say some patterns may look phonetically natural, but that's just because historical changes are phonetically natural. And in fact, synchronic phonology is substance-free. This is also known as substance-free phonology. Okay, there's this debate. We can address a similar debate in the domain of sound symbolism. 
Sapir is actually a pioneering work in the modern work on sound symbolism, and he found that nouns words with a, like mal, tend to be judged to be larger than those with e, like mil. And he says this, the symbolic discriminations run encouragingly parallel to the objective ones based on phonetic considerations. And he entertains two hypotheses. The oral cavity is much wider for a than for e. That means that your mouth is much wider for a. And that's reflected upon the meaning of a. An alternative is that the second resonance frequency, or F2, is much lower for a than for e. And we know that the physics tells us that the resonance frequency and the size of the resonance, the size of the resonating cavity are inversely correlated. This is generally known as the frequency code hypothesis. This is just saying that this sound symbolic pattern make phonetic sense. However, not every sound symbolic patterns make phonetic sense. So a typical example is English glue sequences that are used in many words that have to do with light, like glitter, glow, and gloaming. These are known as phonetemes, and there are many other instances of this kind in English. And moreover, they seem to be very psychologically real. They, they form as a unit, meaning bearing unit. And I don't think there is any sense, any phonetic sense, in which GL is related to the notion of light. G or L does not, they do not glow. Okay. Moreover, there seem to be phonetically crazy patterns. So for example, in Korean, A and O are symbolically smaller than U and A. And this pattern is in fact opposite from what is expected from phonetic considerations those considerations that Sapir made. And this reminds us of cases like phon phonetically crazy patterns. A uh, uh, famous example is coda voicing, not coda devoicing, found in Lesgian, discussed by Alan Yu. However, a nonce word study shows that Korean speakers find nonce words with high vowels to be smaller. Contrary to this pattern, maybe this is a case in which grammar takes precedence over lexical patterns. And a similar finding is discussed in the context of formal phonology as well. An example is Yarros' work. Common interest number one, basis of representation. So one longstanding question is, what, 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 does the, what do linguistic representations consist of? Um, in phonology, we can talk about whether uh, distinctive features are defined based on articulation or acoustics. You know, this history of when uh, distinctive features were first proposed by Jakobson, Font, and Halley, they're based ma mainly based on acoustics. And Chomsky's Halley's SPE system is based on mainly articulation. And people like Edward Fleming came back and put back acoustic or auditory based features into phonological system. So this is still debated. Or in the domain of um, speech perception, people ask what's the object of speech perception, articulation, or acoustics? Motor theory and direct realism say that we perceive articulation, whereas auditory theory suggests that it is really acoustic or auditory properties that are perceived. Yes person, um, in the context of sound symbolism, entertain both hypotheses. Again, he's talking about E being small, and he says, the reason why the sound E comes to be easily associated with small and U or A with bigger things may be to some extent the high pitch of the vowel. So this is acoustic explanation. The perception of the small lip aperture in one case and the more open mouth in the other may also have its share in the rise of this idea. So the second is the articulatory based explanation. My impression is that researchers on sound symbolism are willing to accept both articulatory and acoustic expl explanations at the same time, rather than arguing for one over the other. Um, there are some arguments for acoustic-based explanations. Like in some languages, high tones are associated with smallness in some languages. And I'm not sure if there's any sense in which the articulation of high tones is small. 
except that maybe the larynx is raised a little bit so that um, the, the oral cavity is smaller, maybe. The inverse of F2 is a really good predictor of size judgment across different languages. So maybe this is a case in which acoustic property like F2 is relevant. Non-speech sounds, which really do not have any articulatory sources, can yield sound, sound, some sound symbolic images. So we see similar experiments in the phonetic literature, but a similar experiments have been done in the sound symbolic literature as well. But there are senses in which articulatory explanation seems to be better. For example, F1 is not very relevant in the calculation of sound symbolism. For example, R has higher F1 than E, but it's almost never judged to be smaller than E. And the second argument is probably stronger. Uh, labial segments are often judged to be round, and this probably has to do with the lip rounding of labial consonants. But as far as I can see, there's nothing in the acoustics of labials that are really round. Okay, the third issue, universality and language specificity. So some patterns of sound symbolism seem to be universal, confirmed across languages after languages. One famous example is A ah is big, E is small, and Maluma and Buba are round, and Takede and Kiki are unangular. I should point out that there are exceptions to these generalizations, and that some people point out that some negative results may have been hidden in researchers' cabinet drawers, uh, publication bias. But setting that aside, maybe these are universal. At the same time, there are sound symbolic patterns that are distinguish distinguishingly language particular, like English GLU. Um, and there's this interesting work, often cited by Iwasaki et al., um, who say that English speakers who know nothing about um, Japanese can guess the meanings of some onomatopoetic expressions, but not others. So it seems like universality and language specificity, language specificity, specificity co-reside at the same time. And here's an interesting hypothesis, very influential one, put forth by Imai and Kita. This is called um, bootstrapping hypothesis of sound symbolism. And they say, um, young children are sensitive to all possible sound symbolic correspondences that could appear in any language of the world, but only a subset of these correspondences are compatible with the phonological inventory and the existing words in the language that the children are learning. As they grow up, the sensitivity to the incompatible correspondences wanes, and the adults maintain only the sensitivity to the compatible correspondences. And um, if you're a formal phonologist, then this may remind you of a stamps proposal about phonological processes and rules. Children are born with a set of universal processes, and they unlearn some of them, and they learn some language particular rules. Okay, cumulativity. Cumulativity, the question of cumulativity is this, when there are multiple effects, do they add up or not? And this is one of the important debates in phonological theory because harmonic grammar with weighted constraints um, say yes, these uh, multiple effects should add up. Optimality theory with ranked constraints on the other hand say no. You take the most important constraint into consideration and ignore the rest. And um, studies of um, cumulativity are building up these days so we can consider two types of cumulativity. One is two instances of the same sound, given them whether they evoke stronger images or not, it's called counting cumulativity. And there are several attested cases like that. Um, there's on another case called ganging up cumulativity. That's when there are different sounds which are all associated with the same image and whether these effects add up or not. A clear case is demonstrated by Donofrio, who show that labiality, consonant voicing, and vowel backness all contribute to the perception of roundness in a cumulative fashion. 
And here's some uh, selfish promotions. In several recent papers, I demonstrate several patterns of cumulative effect in sound symbolism and model, model them using max and harmonic grammar framework. There's a paper appearing in phonology and also one appearing in journal of laboratory phonology. So it seems like um, sound symbolic patterns are cumulative, but there's an interesting case in baby talk register of Japanese in which one instance of palatalization makes the whole utterances baby-like. So this is works in like, like an OT fashion. Finally, positional asymmetry. In, phon in phonology, um, it's very famous that some positions are strong, like stress syllables, onset, or the initial segments. They are strong in the sense that they resist neutralization, they can trigger harmony or assimilation, they license a wider range of segments, etc. And there's some reports that sound symbolic effects are stronger in some positions than others. Like word initial segments evoke stronger images than word internal segments. But this is kind of understudied area, and I think more experimentation is necessary. In short, I hope I have demonstrated that theoretical phonologists and sound symbolism researchers share many interests in common. So I believe that we can mutually learn from each other. Unfortunately, that is not very much the case right now, but in the future, I hope that we can collaborate more. Thank you.